So be aware of this when you communicate. So that brings us, as I said, to topic four. So come back to topic four. Different levels of communication. Communication occurs at several levels. Now the first one is verbal. On one side it's verbal, on the other side it is non-verbal. In verbal we have intraverbal, which has to do with intonation of words and sound, which is what we did hello and goodbye. That's the intonation of the words and the sound. Then there is extraverbal, which is the semantics, that is the study of the meanings of words which is the implication of words and phrases. Like a husband comes home and he sees that the table is very dirty, with covered with dust, and he writes on it with his finger, I love you, my dear wife. You know, what is the message conveyed ostensibly? I love you, my dear wife. What is he really saying? Sarcastic. Huh? Clean up the table. Huh? That's the real message. You know? So that's the semantics aspect of it. And the semantics aspect. That's the extra verbal aspect of it. Non-verbal, gestures, postures, and movements. That's the second part. Third is proxemics, that is the use of spatial distances, the space, the distance between two people at which they feel comfortable. We'll talk about that when we talk about gestures in detail. Right now, I just wanted to be aware of the different levels. Then there is symbolic level, which Jung talked about. Like cow is a symbol in India, symbolizing what? Yeah? Religious part of holiness, mother, and so on. Every flag is a symbol of that nation. You know, even the colors in the flag may be the symbol of something. You get it? So, what we call symbol is a term, a name, or even a picture that may be familiar in daily life, yet that possesses specific connotation in addition to its conventional and obvious meaning. It implies something vague, unknown, or hidden from us. Now, any master of the art of communication understands these levels intellectually as well as intuitively. Because understanding them intellectually will help you, help you give lecture on it, but will not make you a good communicator. Because for that, you need to know them intuitively. <coughs> we apprehend that the soul of the art, he apprehends that the soul of the art of communication lies in simplicity, sincerity, and self-understanding. These are the things which must be there for the communication to be worthwhile. It should be simple, precise, sincere, and it show that you understand yourself, because then you'll be clarity of thought. Pascal, he wrote a friend of his, he says, I've made this letter a little longer because I lack the time to make it shorter. I made this letter a little longer because I lack the time to make it shorter, you know, because writing something, you know, which is precise, it requires some thinking. As he pointed out, if I had to speak for two minutes, I would think for five minutes, right? Mr. Government, you with me? All right. That brings us to topic five, barriers in communication. Now, what are the barriers? Now, the question was asked by you, Sandeep, that there is this grounding, but how can we ground ourselves, you know, fast, from one to the next? Now, the answer is, if you are aware of what the barriers are, you can do something to eliminate them. So, to know that you've got a problem is a, some approach to the solution, you know. So, there are several barriers. First one, barriers that have to do with the communicator. That is unwillingness to say things differently. Well, I, you know, they always you suggest something to them. It's oh no, it wouldn't work. They never bother to try it out whether it will work or not. So it will never work. Then unwillingness to relate to others differently. He's like that. I cannot change. You know, he's never going to change. But how about you? You know. Then unwillingness to learn new approaches. That is a beautiful uh, play by Arthur Miller, The Death of a, Death of a Salesman. Has anybody read it? You seen it? Willie Loman, the hero, he is a top salesman, you know, and then he has certain technique that he uses all the time, and suddenly the generation changes, and the new generation cannot identify with this sort of a technique, and he no longer has any business. You know, 
So that's the death of us because he learned, did not learn the new approaches to meet the demands of the changing world. Because the communication used to be something few years back, now it is changing. People are much more aware there is information explosion. You know, with the television now in India, you know, it will be more information available to people than it is. it has been in the past. Which, you know, while the child may not have fantastic vocabulary, but he knows a lot of things that are happening around the world. You see? So, uh, unwillingness to learn new process. Voice quality. Disagreement between verbal and non-verbal message. Lack of self-confidence. Lack of self-awareness. Vocabulary level. It might be too high or too low. Either will be, you know, problematic. You see? Like I was coming... Uh, I mentioned that in the public lecture, I was coming from Madras a few months back after a seminar and uh, I you know, went through the security and the rest of it. We were going towards the airplane and uh, behind me was this hefty American, you know, but must be 30, 35 and I was wearing kurta pajama and I carry a sitar with me when I travel. So I have this sitar and I am standing like this, he is behind me. So I look back and he looks at me and smiling, he says, hi! You know, it's an exuberance only Americans can come up with, you know. So I look at him and I say, hi. So he says, uh, so I started talking since he initiated the conversation. I said, where are you from? So he said, from Florida, man. You know, and he lifts a cardboard fan that he had picked up at Marina Beach in Madras showing the palm tree and the ocean. He says, looks just like this. You know, he shows me this cardboard fan because he never thought I would have been there. You know, so... Uh, I smile. I said, that's very good. I didn't contradict or didn't say I'd been to Florida because that was, you know, showing off that was not needed. So uh, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a teacher. So I got really interested. I'm a teacher and I'm a teacher. I said, yeah, what do you teach? So he looks at me very smugly and he says, eschatology. <laughs> huh? Eschatology. How many of you know what it means? Hmm? <laughs> It's a, it's a you know, foreign word to even to English-speaking people. You know, we have for Indians, Indi Eng you know, English is a second language. But even if you're an Englishman or an American, you still would not know. Chances are you still wouldn't know. It's a very technical word, as it were, for religious purposes. You know, in religion, eschatos in Greek means far beyond or after, which means what will happen to human race or b us after the end of history. That's what... So hereafter, any theory in religion that has to do with hereafter is eschatology. Now, I used to teach religion once upon a time, so I happen to know the term. So I look at him, I say, you are a preacher, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was his time to be shocked then. Because <laughs> he didn't expect some guy in Kurta Pajama to know what eschatology means. So he looks at him, he says, you know what it means? I say, yeah, because I in instantly all things went through my mind. He must have said that to lots of Indians, you know. And they, Indians have a habit of never saying, I don't know. You know. Culturally, it's our trade. We never say, I don't know. You know? You know? Even you get into a cab and say, drive me such and such place. He's going in a wrong direction halfway through. He says, where are you going? He says, aapko kaan jana hai? You know, he will ask you, where do you want to go? You know? But he never say, I don't know where it is when you told him. You know? we, we are afraid to say, I don't know. You know. We have this need to be perfect. So, you know, when he says eschatology, most Indians will say, oh, uh -huh, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> Carry on, you know, <laughs> without knowing what he's talking about. <laughs> that's interesting, fine, wow, you know. So when I told him you're a preacher, he was so he looks at me and I said, Why do you do this? And he was very apologetic and so on. But this happens. He was doing it consciously. Some people do it unconsciously. You know, use big words. Not to show up, but that's just become a habit. And this thing even started at a very early age, this sort of a communication training. My sister is a gynecologist, FRCOG London, you know, and uh, all her friends are gynecologists. Husband, wives, everybody is a gynecologist. You know, and, uh, even their children are gynecologists, you know. <laughs> so the one day I was there at this party and about 36 gynecologists, you know, talking with each other. And their children were playing on the other side and I was observing the kids. And one guy takes up the mother's purse and he tells the, his, you know, his little sister, he says, hey, I'm going to do a caesarean on this. And he opens the zipper of the purse. <laughs> 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 you know? And this other sister, she puts her finger and takes out a 10 rupee note and says, I'm doing a forceps. <laughs> this is a seven, six, seven-year-old kid. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> Imagine, you know, them growing up. <laughs> it's horrible. The whole thinking is conditioned right at that time. Or if you go to America, you open the yellow pages of the telephone directory where different professions and other things are listed. Any junior you find, 90% of the time they are either lawyers or accountants. Because if the, if the father is the senior and the son is the junior, before he's born, there is an office for him. That he's going to be the chartered accountant and he will work in this office 30 years from now. That much programming. So their whole training from that day on, his communication pattern is geared to this one thing. So when they talk to you, they talk like a chartered accountant. You see, there's no human personal touch to it. And then that's why Eric Byrne calls it scripting. They're all given a script to read in their life. You know, that they keep on reading. They think they're reliving their own life, which is programmed that early. Be, you know, before they get they're born, the father has an office for them. Think about it. Junior. So, that is the, uh, another part. So, vocabulary level. Then lack of enthusiasm, lack of training in the art of speaking or writing, lack of motivation, negative self-image. We'll deal with that. Self-image basically is what you think about yourself, all positive, negative and otherwise. Totality of that makes your self-image. Lack of feedback, that's a very, very important part of communication, getting feedback from people. Now, you don't have to ask them to, just by watching them. When I told a particular word, I look at Sandeep's face and he goes, mm -hmm. and he makes a face, I know he hasn't gotten it. So that is a feedback for me. I don't have to ask him, do you understand? Because he has already told me he doesn't understand. You see? Or anything is not clear, he instantly suggests by the way people's faces are. It's a very expressive thing. So you observe them, because lack of feedback, I have a classic example, which... Uh, I made at a public lecture, I gave this, but it's worth, you know, for all of you to just remember for good. It's a beautiful piece of, uh, you know, communication which gives you what, why you need feedback. And this is the Haley's ear, you know, Comet Haley's ear, so this is about Haley's Comet. A colonel issued the following directive to his executive officers. Tomorrow evening, at approximately 20.00 hours, Halley's Comet will be visible in this area, an event which occurs only once every 75 years. Have the men fall out in the battalion area in fatigues, and I'll explain this rare phenomenon to them. In case of rain, we will not be able to say anything, so assemble the men in the theater, and I'll show them films of it. So the executive commander to the company commander. By order of the colonel, Tomorrow at 20, 00, 00 hours, Haley's Comet will appear above the battalion area. If it rains, fell the men out in fatigues, then march to the theater where this rare phenomenon will take place, something which occurs once every 75 years. So the company commander to lieutenant. By order of the colonel in fatigues at 20, 00, 00 hours tomorrow evening, the phenomenal Haley's Comet will appear in the theater. <laughs> In case of rain, in the battalion area, the colonel will give another order, something which occurs once every 75 years. <laughs> Lieutenant to sergeant, tomorrow at 20, 00, 00 hours, the colonel will appear in the theater with Haley's Comet, <laughs> something which happens every 75 years. If it rains, the colonel will order the comet into the battalion area. <laughs> and sergeant to the squad. When it rains tomorrow at 20, 00, 00 hours, the phenomenal 75-year-old General Haley, <laughs> accompanied by the colonel, will drive his comet car through the battalion theater in fatigue. <laughs> Feedback. Yeah. This is, ladies and gentlemen, particularly the fate of written messages, memos that are so prominent in every company's. Because it's a one-way communication, so it's not a communication. I said communication means sharing, that's the one way. So hardly any feedback, and that's why they got problem. Then they call the guy and they say, why didn't you do it? Do what? By the time it got to him, it was something else. And he did exactly that. So lack of feedback. Then prejudice. 
You know, somebody comes who is 17 year old and give a lecture on something, you say, oh, his mother's milk is not dry on his lips, you know, what can he say? <laughs> you know, so dismiss him, you know. That's a Sanskrit metaphor, you know, that's a Sanskrit line. You know, all Maharaj, Mahabharata and Rama, and that's what they talk about. Here and now are internal and external factors. Then barriers that have to do with the receiver of the message. Selective perception. Depending on what your background, your conditioning is, you listen to certain things. Unwillingness to change, lack of interest in the topic. Is Mr. Krishnan of the Indo-American Society announced that Professor Rishikumar Pandya will teach a seminar on uh, sweat gland activities of Australian aborigines? Now, you wouldn't come here. You, know, you wouldn't even want to know about your sweat gland activities, much less about Australian aborigines. So it's interest in the topic. That's also a factor that influences your listening. Then re prejudice. Then rebuttal instinct. There are some people in every public speaking or any audience whose full-time job is to disagree with the speaker no matter what the speaker says. <laughs> no, there are some people in every audience. We call it rebuttal instinct. Once I was in California, it was a public lecture, some 600 people, and uh, I said everybody is suggestible. We all accept suggestion from somebody. And there was one guy in the back. He said, no, I'm not. You know, the type, you know, who have this. I knew when he's like that, he's more suggestible because emotional people are highly suggestible. Anything emotional that makes you more suggestible. So whether it's the grief, whether it's the sore, you know, sadness, surprise, confused, any emotional state makes you suggestible. So when I said, uh, nobody, he said, I'm not. I said, so I knew exactly. I said, can you prove it? He said, certainly. I said, come over here. So he ran from the back. I said, sit down. So he sat down. I said, there's two suggestions you just accepted. Come here and sit down. He looks at me and says, that's true. <laughs> because that is the, our nature. Right from day one, we are brought up on suggestion. Girl is touched differently than a boy from day one. Is that true? You know, girl in India, you touch her gently, say, oh, Lakshmi, which means bad news. You know, but we don't say it. <laughs> we say Lakshmi, you know. Well, that's the way, you know. At the age of three, the girl gets a ready-made doll to play with, the boy gets a mechano set. So he builds the bridges that break, you know. So that's the training, right from age three, it, it, or suggestions are given. So then, uh, vocabulary, voice quality of the speaker, gestures of the speaker, lack of eye contact in the communicator, if the communicator is visible, that is. Here and now, internal and external factors. Then environment, third part, environmental barriers and physical barriers. That is the effect of acoustic noise, you know, the TV or stereo, anything going on. Temperature in the room, too hot, too cold. Other very interesting thing, barriers imposed by social or situ situational structure, like waiting room in a doctor's office. Go to any waiting, you feel like you are in Smashan. <laughs> You know, people are there flipping through pages of 15-year-old magazines where all bad pictures have been taken by somebody. <laughs> no, if people are afraid to talk with each other, you know. That's the, that because that's the uh, imposition or barrier is imposed by the environment. Or in New York subway, if you're, you know, in New York, if you smile or say something, somebody might stab you, literally. You might be dead. It's a no-no. Or there's another one. Next is uh, inside a moving lift. I've seen people happily married for 25 years. Put them in a lift. <laughs> Have you seen it or not? That's what they become, like sculpture, you know. <laughs> Looking at the floor indicator. They don't even recognize each other. Like a statue standing looking at the floor indicator. 25 years, they're happily married. They're afraid to talk to each other. Barriers imposed by the you know, environment. Encounter groups. We don't have them in India yet. In California, they started in the 60s. Therapy groups, we have them. In all these things, there are certain barriers which are imposed and there are certain things which are restricted. Now, I mentioned in the morning that there is a questionnaire which will give you some insight in yourself as your self-image, your perception. So here is a questionnaire, topic 6. I want you to answer each question. There are 25, I believe. Are there 25? Yeah. Yeah. Answer all of them right now. 
The topic six, know thyself. Are you all looking at it? Yes. W.H. Auden, the poet, said, The image of myself which I try to create in my own mind in order that I like myself or love myself is very different from the image which I try to create in the minds of others in order that they may love me. Or as T.S. Eliot put it, we prepare a face for the faces that we meet. You know, the Nobel Prize winning poet T.S. Eliot, we prepare a face for the faces that we meet. You know, so I want you to go through these questions, answer each question honestly. Your attitudes, prejudices, cultural background, conditioning, opinions and beliefs play a vital role in communication. When you answer the following questions, you may get some new insights into yourself as a person as well as a communicator. Start answering. Is it all, all yes and no questions? And right there, shall we write it right in the right there, right in the in the right in the menu. It's yes or no. Some are yes or no. Some might require a little more. Finished? Yes, sir. Who is not finished? Okay. Okay, sure. Couple of more minutes. Okay, everybody finished? Anybody not finished? Finished? Okay. Let us go over it question by question, so just in, in case you need some clarification. Do I put on a show to get attention? Do I think people exploit me? They both have to do something with negative self image or low self image. You know, if you do not think much of them, you think people will exploit you. You know, unassertiveness part also will come into that. Do I usually begin my conversation apologetically by saying things like, I do not want to bother you or am I taking up your time? You know, again the same thing, that you do not feel much that you deserve that time. <coughs> Four, do I feel uncomfortable when suddenly there is a silence at a social gathering, which means you are uncomfortable with yourself. You know, lots of people who are used to limelights have this problem, like actors and people like that. You know, they cannot be by themselves, it is the most horrible and depressing experience for them. Do I rationalize or defend myself when somebody criticizes me? Do I feel uncomfortable when I am not in the limelight at a social gathering? Uh, what is your answer to the question number 5 and what does it mean? I mean uh, would you My rationalize or defend myself when somebody criticizes me? If uh, I, I would say yes, I do not know what it means. But yes, no, would... Okay, just a second, let me answer him first, is that right Mustafa? No, no, okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, your question is, you said yes. That basically means that uh, you are not open to any criticism or suggestion that people might offer you. But I mean normally, I, yeah. mean, uh, it's, uh, I mean one is not aware whether one rationalizes, but normally people, most of us do rationalize, I mean it's part and parcel of our… Uh, How many put yes to it? How many put no to it? Sometimes. 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 Okay. So basically what it means nonetheless to answer your question is that… Uh, it becomes uncomfortable because you think you are always right. That need will make you defend all the time. May also a symptom of confidence. In some cases, but if you are right, nobody could ever be right except… All the time, yeah, nobody yeah. Can, but one tries to rationalize that. I don't mean to say yeah. that even, so which one means, fully well hmm. that one may be wrong, yeah. tries to rationalize. Right. That means you have not come to terms with yourself enough to recognize that you could be wrong and gracefully accept the criticism. No, it is a, it's a regular phenomenon. By, by, just like as you said, you huh. ask a person why are you late, it's something huh. like that. You right. have to explain yourself, that's all. Which Knowing fully well that you might be wrong. But there are some right. type of people who just argue, whether even if you appreciate what they are doing, they will start defending them. And if you criticize them also, they will start defending them. Yeah, basically which means they, they might be showing they are confident, but you know, they are not, it's come to some integrated that part 
within themselves because when they are not quite at ease with that sort of a thing with themselves or within themselves. We try to yeah? clarify the misunderstanding. That is different than rationalizing or defending. That's the time when we try to defend ourselves. Yeah. It also means that when you try to rationalize and you want to see what the other man really means. I mean, you are rationalizing, you want an argument from the opposite party to say that you are really wrong. But see, the other people might not always argue, they might just give up. True, but the thing is that you would like to be sure whether his criticism is correct or not and that's the reason… Then that's a fair thing if you are doing it for a, that reason. A, you are trying to argue it out whether he is I mean, whether he yeah. is criticizing you really or for the sake of criticism. Right. I understand. For that differentiation, you might do it. Sure. Mustafa, you… Yes or no? Okay, sometimes it's fine, which means sometimes <laughs> when you felt the need, so that happens to most of us. Okay, the next, do I feel uncomfortable when I am not in the limelight at a social gathering? Seven, do I feel uncomfortable when I am around people who are more educated or richer than I am? How many put yes to that? Which one, educated? Both. Both. Educated. Educated. Educated and sometimes rich. I see. Which means again, that is a question of self-image, how you perceive yourself. Yeah, yes. you know? So I want you to work on that, all right, Sandeep? Then, do I have some nervous mannerisms or tics? By that I mean biting your fingernails or, you know, this, one guy came to me once for treatment in Montreal. I said, do you have any nervous tics? He says, no. <laughs> He was not even aware of it. His neck is going like that all the time. You know, some people are not aware of that they're biting their fingernails. You know, they just do it so automatically and subconsciously, as it were, that they are not aware of it. It was just very normal as far as they are concerned. Is it normal mannerism? I'm talking about right now in this question. I'm talking about nervous tics. But even certain consider see certain things which are considered normal by cultural norms are also because of nervousness or nervous energy. To give you an example, here is a cultural trait in Indians for discharging nervous energy. They do this too at their legs or you sitting in a train and talk to some Indian about relaxation. What do you mean relaxation? You know, we in India we have always relaxed, you know, and the leg is going like this all the time, jerking. Whole train is shaking because every Indian is doing it. And they say, oh, Shavasana was invented here, you know. Yoga started here. We don't need relaxation. What are you talking about? Because this is a culturally accept acceptable trait in India for Indians to discharge nervous energy. You know, so it is not noticed. It's common. Nonetheless, it is a nervous mannerism is what I want you to appreciate. Does it answer your question? Or in the Middle Eastern countries, they wear these worry beads. You know, wear a rosary around their wrists and they keep on doing this all the time. Doing this all the time. Is it for worry? No, that's what we call it that because this, <laughs> yeah, that's the way of discharging that. We call it worry bit, you know, getting rid of the energy. All right. Do I, to make Do I tend to make fun of others? Do I feel I am not the person I seem to be? You know, like sir. What about the fun of others? What is, your, what is the meaning of that question? Because if you think you are making always fun of others, that means you feel you are superior to somebody else or you are better than somebody else. Well, I mean, uh, it's a generalized thing. I mean, you may. Yes, it is generalized. But you are not asked the same thing uh, whether you make fun of yourself. Now you also make. That fun also means the same thing. Also means yes. Complex. Yes. It or, no, it means basically your self image is low. No, you make fun because for the sake of fun you make your, like, first of all you make fun of yourself and then you make fun of others. Right. But it's if you are doing it routinely, routinely, yes. routinely. then I uh, will look at it a little more <laughs> carefully. <laughs> <laughs> it is really just for the sake, I it's understand. just trying to be funny, you know, then yeah. when people do it all the time because they are just not trying to criticize the person. Right, I understand. But now the, the, the question is… Uh, yes, that is sometimes it is because of the low self-image they do it. Well, there are some people who have the ability to laugh on themselves. That is different, you know, that is a healthy philosophical way of looking, that's one thing. Making fun in the sense of criticism, because even in a, as one of the uh, Marshall McLuhan once said, even in every joke there is a complaint, you know, of some sort. So that is some underlying thing there. When, when you talk of making fun of someone, hmm. do you mean that you intentionally want to hurt him or you just, I mean, suppose you just making fun of him, I mean, just not to hurt him? See, it will, be depend, it will depend, of course, on your intention, you know. Okay. If you're jokingly making it just for joking, yeah. if you, that's the routine way you are doing it all the time, 
then maybe there is something more to it than just the joking part. And the person who doesn't do it, does he have a higher philosophy? I mean, or is he more confident? No, not necessarily. So, but why? This is one of the ways some people have that self-image, some people express it in another way. That's right. I mean, this question by itself doesn't convey much. No, the question conveys only one of the manifestations of having low self-image. Yes, but I mean, you know, okay, we'll... The opposite is not true. The converse isn't true. Which means if you don't make fun of others, does not mean you're confident. But you might be having nervous, nervous sticks again. Okay. You know, the point is, these are different... See, different people express... Like some people have a body that is suffering from some sickness. But the sickness generally falls into a part of their body that is most vulnerable. Depending on their lifestyle, habit, heredity, a whole lot of other factors. But so, this is just one of those things. My, let's, I mean, let's imagine because I'm... I'm sure I am sorry if I am making uh, people... Don't see, you are going into that apology now. Just, yeah, you deserve it. That's the reason, but I have <laughs> done it once, so I don't want to repeat it. Uh, the thing is that, uh, by and large, huh. every schoolboy makes fun of his, uh, you know, friends. Huh. Right. They are friends and the idea is to make fun of each other. Right. Right. There is nothing low. Right? No, right. It doesn't make Granted. any... It doesn't have any uh, hidden meaning in it. Right. It is just that unless you make, friend, uh, make fun of your friends, you are not hmm. friends. Okay. Unless you pull each other's legs, which is hmm. trying to say making fun of each other, you're not friends. How yeah. can you call yourself friends if you okay, can't? Got it. So then how is it making a low image of yourself? No, no, we later on if you make it a point always to go to make fun criticize of people. Criticize people, yeah. yeah in that sense. Not, but your question doesn't say do you criticize people, it's a make fun of people and making fun and of And here in expression wise, uh, I'll look at it that way. No, my mother. Others is all. What? Others not necessarily. Friends. See, I'm not talking about any particular people. Not necessarily friends. Hmm. I'm talking about in general. Even sense. in general, I'm saying you are making. If you are always making fun of people, okay. that to me will mean, you know, that uh, there is something that you are trying to hide or I something. Mean, right. I mean, that's a general thing. You that's are all I'm to, saying. You know, okay, fine. Hmm? Do I feel I'm not the person I seem to be? You know, sometimes you're doing something, you sit back and sort of ask yourself, "Am I really doing this?" You know, am I, did I really do this or did I talk to somebody like this? I mean, that doesn't seem to be somebody like I will do, something I like to do. Do I feel comfortable about, my, comfortable about my looks? If the answer is no, which means again there is a part of that self-image part. Huh? Do I mind giving my opinions when asked? Or do you sort of dilly-dally or wish be wishy-washy about it? You know? What kind of people am I fond of? What did you write, Deepak? I wrote social, good-looking, fun-loving, careful, humorous, equal. Careful? Careful. I, I don't like careless people. I see. In what sense? Well, um, I like things to be organized, well put, well thought of, thorough, thing planned. Yes, okay, good. What have you got, Padmana? Straightforward, simple and constant. Chattinar? Soft spoken and agreeable. Soft spoken and agreeable. Okay. Mustafa? My type. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. My type, you know. Man. <laughs> I'll have a whole world of clones. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Sandeep, what did you write? Friendly. Huh. Duru? And they was up. Normal, I said. No. Extremes in all, uh, you know, whether they're good or bad. That's right. There are extremes. Huh. I like normal people, whether they're better or good. That's right. Good. Okay. What kind of people do I dislike? Deepak, what did you put there? Egoistic, rude, overpowering, callous. That's right. Shardul? No, argumentative or would try to get more aggressive. Adhikari, sir? Serious, who, who sort of refuse to change. Serious, who refuse to... Serious is one side. Ah, and the second category is who refuse to change. How about you? What do you put? I've written uh, crooked and insincere types. Like. Crooked and insincere. I like, uh, don't like the people who show off with the, for the money and all. Or those who uh, don't have etiquettes and manners. And those are careless people. That's right. You and Deepak should get together, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what did you write? I don't like people who talk about himself always. Who what? Who talk about himself. Talk about himself always. There was this one actress who was talking to a friend of hers and she spoke about herself for about 25 minutes 
And then she turns to the friend and she says, oh, I've been just realized I've been talking about myself all the time and I've been the only one talking. Now why don't you talk something about me? <laughs> what did you write? Those who are not as in question number 14. I see. That's fair enough. <laughs> That's a government answer, you know. <laughs> Those who are not there fit here, you know. <laughs> not mentioning paragraph 4a, section 3, you know, clause 5, right? <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Is there anybody who say I don't dislike anybody? Oh, that's good. Honest people. Yeah. <laughs> no. 16. What topics in conversation make me feel uncomfortable? For example, money, sex, religion, family background, political views, looks, income, etc. Or any other. What kind of topics in conversation? Let's see, start. I will go with everybody. Deepa? Social, I mean, social. The Sandeep? Social topics. Social topics. Meaning? Social meaning? Uh, family matters are all this. Right, Jyoti? Political views. Political views. I said none. Huh? I said none. None? No. Nothing makes you uncomfortable? No. Sure? Sure. Okay. I'll find that out in a minute. <laughs> None. Political views. No. Any other book? I don't know. You don't know. Any other besides that? Nothing makes you feel uncomfortable? No. Huh? No. I see. None. None. None Money and income. Money and income. Money and income. Family background. Family background. Well, I've written, depends in what mannerism the topic is being discussed. I see. One more now. Income. 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 Money and income. Huh? Money and income. Money and income. They're both separate. Yeah. Looks. Looks. Nothing in particular. It all depends upon the environment again. It I depends see. where you're sitting, with whom you're sitting. Okay. Law. I hate law. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> I like the energy and vehemence which we do say. <laughs> yeah. Um, money and family background. Money and family background. Family background, political news, and none. 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 Is that right? Three people with none. Huh? None. Four. Anything that embarrasses me. What are they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm rather not going to. Oh, you rather not go <laughs> because that that itself is embarrassing. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yes, party. Political view, religion. Hey? Religion and political view. Yes, sir. What about myself? How about yourself? It all uh, depends on the room I'm speaking. Okay. Looks and money. Looks and money. Nothing I've encountered so far has made me uncomfortable. Okay. Fair enough. <coughs> All right, what feelings do I find hard to handle? Emotional. Which ones though? The emotions are of, you know. You get emotion on any issue. Huh? There's, there's nothing to get so emotional about it. That's a Bengali characteristic of the <laughs> They get very excited about politics, yeah. I've seen. There's nothing hmm. to get emotional about any issues in life. Huh? Okay, it's, it's an happening. Uh -huh. It's all good. So, what's that? Uh, Laugh over it or sort of, okay, just take it on a normal way. I see. Sit anger. Anger. I don't think I'm aware of such. I mean, it, it is again a very occasional thing which anything can embarrass you at any moment of time. I see. The question is. I just want you to be aware of your most of the time non committal or sitting on something. I want you to be a little more precise about this thing yeah, for yourself. It, it all depends upon with whom you are sitting. You are, uh, so specify which, if you are sitting with this what and sitting with that what. I'm just saying if this. If you're sitting with close people, you're not uh, not embarrassed of anything. Right. And if you're not sitting with close people. And then we say if you're not sitting with very, I mean, you're sitting with new people and you want to discuss uh, private lives, it, it does, that might embarrass Okay. So what I'm saying is, for your clarification, I want you to specify and don't leave it at that. Okay? That will clarify the issues for you. Huh? Okay. What emotion? Sometimes. I get excited. What feelings we are People are not ready to listen. And that time I get excited. Yeah, and I come Asha. Duru? Anger. Anger. Anger and fear. Asha? Grief and frustration. Anil? Me? Arun. 
somebody crying, difficult to handle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, why, I want to tell you something interesting. See, if some emotions make you this way, then the people who know you can utilize that to manipulate you. You understand? That's done all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. That's no, because they will, because they know that when he, this is talked about, you will feel uncomfortable. You'll be on the defensive. You see? No, so, no, I have written. I can't say huh? because I really I tried to understand. I could not uh, answer this question. Right. Now, is it necessary that I should search for it? No, it's not so necessary. It's not necessary. No, no. Somehow, put something. No, necessary. no. Can't say it. So no, you can't say it. Can't say. All right. Now, if the people who want to get out of this, if there is some feeling, because in that sense, if you don't want to be on the defense, you get somebody who is close enough to you and make him, ask, make him ask question on that topic and go through the discomfort, experience it, so you will be desensitized to that particular part. Does it make sense? Do you understand what I am saying? Get immune to that. Yeah, right, precisely. So, you get desensitized, immune to that particular thing by answering, going through the discomfort. But, but once you must be aware of what you are uh, Yes, of course, to. precisely. Right. You should be aware From of it. whom it is coming. It's a source right. of. Uh, so you will feel it. If you think about it in different experiences you had, you will know where it came from. Yeah, like uh, Mr. Vakil said that he's a widow cannot handle crying. Right. Yeah, from his family member. Somebody hmm. else is crying, perhaps you would not even notice it. That's a possibility, yeah. <laughs> so it's sure. a question of uh, where the source from which uh, right. the feeling is coming from. True. That will help. No. Okay. What. Say so suppose your problem is money or the area that makes you feel uncomfortable. Then get somebody to ask you a question about money, your income, how much did you earn, how you spend, what did you do, you know, everything, how was your father's background as far as. So go through the discomfort, go through anything that has to be anything to do with money that he can think of, he will ask you and you will answer, even if it is personal. So that way what will happen, the feeling that you are associating with it will get, you know, less. Once you get it out of your system, it doesn't yeah. bother you. You see? All right. Do I use words to impress people? Yes. Huh? Yes. Yes, you do? No. no. How many people wrote yes? I see. Sometimes. Sometimes. It helps. The good rule in communication is use words to express and not to impress. Sometimes to have fun, you might do it. It's just yeah, just for the hell of it, yes, different. Yeah, yeah. You see, the issue is quite different. Like when you're on sort of a competition, huh. say in business or anywhere, right? And you know that okay, Miss, Mr. Pandya likes some big words in English, mm -hmm. so I approach you. Then I you pay your claim. Yeah, yeah. But I, I know your weakness. Right. I know it's exploitation. But look, but I want to keep my job running. I understand. <laughs> yeah, that's different. What I'm saying is just for the image that you feel that you, that will impress people. That's different. You're doing that for a motive. For a motive. Yeah. Yes. We do use it. Yeah. There's a reason for using it. Right. Else we don't do it. Right. right. Then that's fine. Mr. Adhikari so explained beforehand that huh. he's fond of having fun. I mean, he enjoys the humor. Right. And this is, I think, a part of the humor part process. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because then you're playing game knowingly, yeah. so to speak, as a, using it as a strategy to get the best of the other person. But I'm talking about people who use it routinely to hide something, you know, to sound more intelligent or more educated than really are. That's what the kind I'm talking about. You see. So, uh, like, in fact, this uh, uh, using words to impress of people have helped me where, in, suppose, if I have to communicate pe with people in the rural areas, huh. if I go to government officials, huh. they in fact salute me if I use big, big words. Good. So, then you're doing it for the purpose as Adhikari said. You see? You're doing it for a motive knowingly, for this gain. But some people do it to hide their inadequacy or something. It's different, you know? Some people do it without realizing it. Like I was teaching in Montreal and we had one philosophy teacher, he came to me and he says, uh, Rushin, I was teaching teachers how to teach there. I used to teach a course there. So uh, this guy came for help and he said, I walked into my class, first year college students, teach them philosophy, introduction to philosophy. And he says, I had you know, spent 40 years studying all this, got my degree, PhD, and I walk into the classroom, I spent 40 hours preparing this 40 minute lecture. I walk in there and after 20 minutes I see at their faces and they're all blank and they all want to leave. He said, what did I do wrong? I said, I don't know. I said, I wasn't there. I said, I'll come tomorrow when you have a class and I'll tell you afterwards. So I went in there at the uh, 
I went into his class next day and he walks into the class and he starts things like, okay folks, today we are going to talk about the epistemological problems in philosophy. Now if you look at this problem ontologically, you know, you know, if you don't go into polemics about it, you know, and people, students, eight, they have just come from high school, you know. <laughs> they look at each other and say, what is he saying? And their faces are blank, you know, they don't understand what he's talking about. And I, in 15 minutes, I made a list of 25 words that he had used that I knew they would not know, you know, barring a few exceptions, you know, one or two people might know, but uh, majority of them will not know. So. <laughs> How many of you know what I just said? Epistemology, what does it mean? You don't know. <laughs> Ontology, polemics. Polemics is a disease. Polemics is not a disease. <laughs> it sounds like one. <laughs> this means a great heated argument that is a, well, it's polemics basically. You know, if you, you know, argue, debate about something in a very heated image, that's known as polemic sort of a thing, you know, I mean, warlike attitude about, anyhow, so, th which means even people don't know these words. So, I, I told him afterwards, I said, these are the kinds of words you use to this class, I mean, how do you expect them to understand? So, he became very different. He said, this is a philosophy course, these are the terms used in philosophy. I said, I understand, I'm not saying not use, don't use it, I'm just saying, tell them what it means the first few weeks. So next time you go in there, they will understand what you're talking about. Because mastering a subject also requires mastering the vocabulary connected with that subject. Isn't that right? You know, you go into medicine, you might master whole sort of terms about anatomy and physiology, which you forget very soon. But you have a whole long list that you've got to remember all these words. If you go into music, vadi and sambhadi and vivadi and asur and atal and all this stuff, and you remember all this. But the point is, other people wouldn't understand. It's a something that is only for the initiated ones. So avoid using those terms, these jar, you know, these sort of words when talking to people who are not within that field. And if you do use them, take time to explain. That's the only thing I'm saying. Does it make sense? Because otherwise people wonder what it will mystify. Some people might be impressed, I tell you. You know. Because I said the leaders mystify, they knowingly use that words to manipulate as Adhikari said to exploit the guy, you know. All right. Do I use words to impress people? What feelings do I enjoy? Am I aware of my facial and bodily, ex bodily expression? Am I aware of different smells including that of my body? How many wrote yes to that? How many wrote no to that, that I am not aware? Hmm. All right, ask others who are close to you. <laughs> Do I sigh or cough for no apparent reason? Do I identify with the roles I play? How many said yes to that? What's the meaning of this? Oh, what's the meaning? Ah, good, good. So ask me. <laughs> Say you are working, yeah? you are working in a company. So, the, you are a manager or executive of that company. That's the role you play. See, most of the problems arise when you identify with that role. Because then anybody criticizes your ability as a manager, you will feel personally hurt. You see, if somebody says you did not do this job well, you will think that I am a failure. Because the problem arose because of your identification with the role of a manager. So, if you want to be secure about yourself and have to, if you want a positive self-image, about yourself, then always learn to separate your role that you perform in life as a servant or a working for somebody, executive, whatever, or a student from what you are as a person, as an individual, as a human being. You understand the distinction? So make the separation between yourself and your mistakes or what Vedanta will say, have Sakshi bhav, you know, be a witness or have uh, drashtabha, be an observer to the person who is doing something. Say I enjoy cooking, so I burn chapati one day. Somebody says, what kind of a lousy chapati is this? And I say, oh, I'm a failure, you know, I'm not even a good cook, you know, which means I'm bad anyway, I'm not even a good cook, this lousy job of cooking chapati even I cannot do. So that is because of my negative self-image, because I identify with this. No, uh, and professor, a point Rushi, just Rushi, call anyway. Okay, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, too senior for uh, See, 
I have written usually yes. The hmm. reason is, but at the same time, I do have what you are telling also fits in because right. we are in it but not in it. Huh. So at the same time, but both are real. Huh. That one identifies huh. plays your part fully. If you are going at home, if you are the father, you play your part of the father fully. Right. You don't have to be saying I'm away from it. Huh. Now, if you go to office and sit in your chair, you are uh, playing that part with the full. I mean, you don't feel you are uh, something. You are different, and you are only playing. You are really. Yeah, you're, you're really there. Of course, you are. But at the same time, when you are at the same time, you're not attached. Please. These are uh, possible. You can identify fully huh. and not be in it at the same time. Or you, I, I can say it a little differently that you can play the role professionally and still you know. still be away. And yes, when sure. You change your role. You go home. You are different, but play that role well. But yeah, yeah. Why should not be all the time be away? Means not away. I by detached. Off. It's not being away, which means you involve fully, but yes, that you don't true. become the person. That that is the distinction. Huh? You understand? I don't want you to identify because if you do identify with the roles you play, then the problem will be that any criticism of the role you will take it as a personal criticism, you will feel the need to defend yourself and your existence. But what does it do? I mean, uh, do I identify with the role I play? I mean, I, yes, when I am sitting there, I identify myself. That's fine. But what I am saying is if somebody criticized that role that Deepak, you did a lousy job. moment of time. Huh. I mean, when if I am if I'm, uh, doing a job and huh. somebody says that you are, you are not doing a good job. Right. But do you feel that as a personal criticism of a job or your role as a manager is criticized? Do you make that distinction is the question. I mean, I, I mean I'm Think about sure, it. Yeah, I'm not sure about the way, I mean, your question at all. I mean, in the sense that you are saying that you should not uh, take it personally. That is correct. True. If it's a personal uh, criticism, one does not take it uh, personally. If it's a job criticism and you're on the job hmm. and you think it's a good, you've done a good job, huh. do you take it uh, in the li I mean, you take it as a criticism, don't you? I mean, don't you take it as, I mean, suppose somebody tells you that you're not a good manager. Right. And you say you are a good manager. Huh. So... Where does... Uh, no, but the point, so you took it. What I'm saying simply, if somebody says you are not a good manager, then if and you translate that as to mean I'm not a good person. No. I that, mean, that's I, all I'm saying. Yeah, but the question doesn't have any, you know, it doesn't really... Uh, when I phrase the question, what I have in mind is what I'm uh, yeah. clarifying, is that if you, if you take that as a personal criticism, then you are identifying with the role and not making that crucial separation. That is an individual you, as Deepak Kharti Singh, is one as opposed to the managing director of a company or whatever, which is different. Yeah, but identifying yourself in a role, huh. whichever you are playing, at the moment of time you are playing a father's role or your manager's yeah, role or a partner's role yeah. or a... Hmm. Man, you do identify. Unless yes, you, you identify, do identify. You are never serious about it. Right, granted, that is precisely what I, I don't want to be serious about it. Hmm. And you know, it, if you are too serious about it, then everything that pertains to that role, you will take it as a personal and you will not make that crucial distinction. Which means, if you are criticized as a manager when you come home, you will be ineffective in your role as a husband or a father also. No, never, nobody criticized me as a I mean, I am just saying. And, uh, no, but what I am saying, it will, have it will have carry over effect. Which means, if you are told today, you are a lousy manager, this, that and the other, you will carry this and your wife says, oh, it's a lovely meal I cooked, go to hell, I am going to bed. So what you have uh, understood is huh. that one identifies only with one role. Huh. What uh, the gentleman says is correct because when he goes home, yeah, he has interest with his the husband. Yeah. Or if he's the sincere servant of the wife, he should sincerely play that role. And in the office, if he's somebody in the office, he's somebody in the office. That's fine. That's that is share your role wherever. I mean, you right. That's what I'm saying. Don't have a carryover effect. That's no, normal. But yeah. the question is not really implicit. It's not even explicit. Not implicit. Yeah. Not okay, fine. The yeah. question it doesn't have any. You know, doesn't direct you to what it's the meaning of the question. Okay, now is the meaning clear yeah, to you? I mean, right. I mean, okay. so uh, one does not carry That is precisely forward. why I'm reading yeah. and explaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one because... One does not carry forward the same image That is correct. Spaces. That is what I'm saying. But isn't it quite normal? I mean, suppose I got a big firing somewhere, go and let know the frustration somewhere else. That is bad. That's what I mean, I'm no, saying. Isn't, I'm, it I'm, happens and that's precisely why you need some help. No, it is not. That right. it should not happen. That, that right. should not happen is what I'm saying. So you mean huh? to say, hmm. just in communication is that... Huh. Say, one of our main jobs is to giving demonstration of, say, management. Right. Management consultants, you keep on giving demonstrations. Right. And then your boss says that you are lousy today. We lost a job because of you. Right. Your communication is poor. Right. And I come all the way, okay, my communication is poor. And I come to Rushi and say, okay, Rushi, do something about it. Right. The whole purpose, mm -hmm. now here, a role I have played. Yeah. I had to be a management consultant. Right. I failed to be a good one. Right. Because of communication, mm -hmm. I come running to you. Right. Now, here, I am carrying my role. Yeah. But for self-improvement. Right. 
So I think it's quite good at times to carry your role also. No, here what I'm saying, if that didn't crack you up, then I'm not a good person. No. That's, that's the distinction I want to make. No, that is a, that's all I'm saying. That you came here, you took criticism well, and you say you want to do better, that's all fine too. As long as it did not hurt your self-image and you did not carry it into other things you do, that you did not lower over that frustration onto your wife or kids, you kick them that day. You, know. you get it? Alright. Next, do I use my voice effectively? How many people said yes? One, two, three, four, five. How many said no? What about others? <laughs> All right. Do <laughs> how do I feel about myself? <laughs> That's nice. How many people wrote great? Oh, good. Two people. <laughs> what did you write? Pretty good. Pretty good. Fine. Okay. Good. I like to make it great. I wrote good. What did you put? Fine. You want to make it great? Okay. Far beyond the best. Far behind the best. Fantastic. Huh? Fantastic. Fantastic. Not? Not very confident. Not very confident. Okay. Confident. Okay. Okay. You're shaking your head this way and that way. You know. <laughs> Is it the Calcutta way or South Indian way? <laughs> <laughs> yes. At ease. At ease. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Positive, confident, but soft spoken. Yes, sir. Good. Confident. Confident. Could be better. Could be better. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Okay. Good. Good. Fine. Fine. Normal. 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 All right. Okay, what are we doing now? Is to uh, please go to topic twelve. I want you to do something. Go to topic twelve. Are you looking at it? It says voice. Huh? There are three, four pages to that thing. So it says topic 12. It says voice, your instrument of communication. Are you looking at it? Yeah. Followed by that, if you turn that page, huh? there are passages. Huh? I want you to read each passage, barring the last one. I want you to read all of them rather, including the last one. Huh? So how many are there? Five passages. Okay. Five. There is one on next page. After half a page, there is one on next page. Right? Huh? Fifth one also. There are five pages of paragraphs. Uh, of different quotation rather or different excerpts from different things. I want you to read the first three now quietly in your mind. Also put down, take a piece of paper, I mean take a pen rather in your hand and uh, read each passage on that first page. Uh, there are three on the first page, is that correct? The fourth one is a little bit. Read each passage quietly to yourself thinking if you had to say it loudly to a group of people, how would you say it? Huh? And in order to do so, you will have to put you have to repunctuate it. Means in all, see these punctuations are done by any author for his purpose. A reader puts the punctuation for his interpretation purpose. So you have to put your own commas and your own full stops into this passage or in that manual. So do it now. Spend 15 to 20 minutes seriously just looking at it. This is a very important exercise for your voice training. So I'm getting you started because we'll be doing most of it tomorrow. But uh, unless you've done some work on it, you won't be able to do it. So read it. 
Yeah, yeah. You can put punctuation marks your way as if you are reading to somebody. Four paragraphs. First, first three. Yeah, there are only three there. Right? All right. All of you finished reading, repunctuating. We'll do a couple of readings, and the listener who listened to these people here, I wanted to make observations about how the message comes through, the message that is in the paragraph, from different points of view, voice, point of view, his delivery, stoppage, what you hear, what you don't hear, and so on. Written comments, not verbal. I want you to write it out. Okay? Who wants to be the first reader? Okay, Shardu. Which passage? So we all can look at it. Passage 2. The state which transcends speech and thought is mona. It is meditation without mental activity. Subjugation of the mind is meditation. Deep meditation is eternal speech. Silence is everything speaking. Ever, sorry. Silence is ever speaking. It is perennial flow of language. It is interrupted by speaking, for words obstruct this mute language. Lectures may entertain individuals for hours without improving them. Silence, on the other hand, is permanent and benefits the whole humanity. By silence, eloquence is meant. Oral lectures are not so eloquent as silence. Silence is un unceasing eloquence. It is the best language. Okay, please wait here. Okay, what did you write? About him, what did you write? He didn't write anything. All right. About speaking to the microphone. I didn't write anything. Okay, did you write something? Okay. My instruction were <coughs> what? Any comments for his voice? Any comments for his voice? These were the instructions given to you. Too loud. Too loud. Yeah. I, I said write it down. Did you write it down? What have you written? Too loud. Too loud. Okay. Who else? Sami, do you have written something? Same thing. Too loud. Too loud. Sit down, Shadow. Anybody else has written anything? Yeah. Okay. Deepak, have you written anything? Regarding this? Yes. A little bit yeah. harsh also. A little uh, bit harsh also, okay? It was not, uh, it was not correct punctuation. Huh. And uh, it didn't have the right emotions. Okay. He didn't carry the right emotions. All right. No fluency in language. No fluency in language, okay. He made a drag on meditation. And second, uh, he said sorry, which is not necessary. It was not in the passage. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. He had, uh, at the end, there is some difficulty in reading, huh. just English reading. That's okay. Now, here is a simple pair. I want you to appreciate, you know, what kind of sardul for your listening, how you come through to people. Right. You know, you're getting the feedback? Right. Okay. Who wants to be the second one? Me. You want to be Asha? Come. I came to Medina and saw a man whose, who, whose counsels men obeyed, and he never said anything, but they obeyed him. I said, Who is this man? They said, This is the Rasul of God. Then I went to him and said, Give me advice. Lord Muhammad said, Abuse nobody. And I never did abuse anybody. After that, neither free man, nor slave, nor camel, nor goat. And he added, And if a man abuse thee, and lay upon a vice which he kneweth in thee, then do not disclose one which thou knowest in him. Arun, your comments about Asha. <laughs> that you haven't told at home. Huh? <laughs> 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 eh? It's typical? Typically, I didn't write anything. Okay, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I, I think it was okay. And I would say okay. Huh. <laughs> All right. 
what are your comments? Patil? You heard her. Doesn't matter. You didn't write. There was some emotional. There was? There was emotional in her voice. Huh. There was emotion. Mustafa? Well, pretty good voice. Sham? <laughs> a nice soft voice. Nice soft voice. Adhikari Sahab? I found it just like a general reading. Just? Just a prayer reading like, okay, <laughs> boys sit down in your class. 40 minutes class, huh. the teacher comes and reads it out. Huh. We like in Indian schools just mark it important for exams. Go away. That's it. Means what? Means it's, uh, there's no life, okay, it is something about philosophy, does not come out from it. Okay, that's what I want to know. Yeah, there's All no right. this thing, real philosophy coming out. Alright. Well, I felt that the tone was good, hmm. but it lacked a dramatic content. You know, it could have been made more dramatic because uh, there is more conversation in there. Right. Satya Asha, are you listening? Yes. Openly? Yes. Okay. The punctuation was correct and the voice was good. And about the religious part of the expressions, I didn't make an observation. Shardul? Nice voice. What else? So. Uh, <coughs> the voice was very soft and good mod modulation in the speech. Mm. There was ups and downs in the sentence. There were or there weren't? They were. They were. Okay. Sri? Voice was good. There was a slight nervous tinge in the voice. Would you speak it a little loudly, please? Do people always tell you to speak a little louder? Pardon? Do people always tell you to speak a little louder? Yeah. I see. Okay. There was, uh, the voice was okay. There was a slight nervous tinge in the voice. And... Uh, one sentence was not pronounced properly. Which one was that? And, not when, and I never did abuse anybody after that. In fact, the sentence was, uh, what she read out was, I never did abuse anybody. Then she started. After that, I... That's it. So the punctuation part, the positive... Maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. And... Uh, maybe some body expressions were required or... Okay. I experienced some kind of uh, spiritual feeling in what she said. Hmm. There was gentleness. She went on rather rapidly and the modulation was insufficient. Okay. Anybody else has any comments? Do we break for tea? All right. To get back one more time. Huh? Okay. Any questions? Now, about those passages, one person asked that I do not identify with any of the feelings or thoughts or philosophy mentioned in this passage, therefore it's hard for me to express. Valid. So find a passage, if you have that problem, find a passage today, bring it here tomorrow with which you can identify. The purpose here is to make you familiar with the possibilities of your own voice. You know, because when people listen to uh, somebody like Amitabh Bachchan, oh, he has a fantastic voice, you know. The main difference is that he is using it, you are not. You know, all of you have excellent voice, but nobody taught you how to use it. That's the major distinction. You're capable of having fantastic voice. So start learning how to use it. It's hard, simply because what voice you have now is a result of lots of years of conditioning, psychological pressures, inhibitions, you know, and a whole lot of other things which we'll talk about tomorrow. And because of that, it has become what it is. And you heard what it is. Three people read and most of the comments you heard. Correct? And it's hard work to do it, but it's worth it because that will improve your communication tremendously. Because automatically you will be able to bring the meaning through your voice, you know, the way you say things. Okay. So I want you to read all those passages tonight. I just read three here, to, you know, today you read just three. And uh, the last one is the most emotional, very dramatic one. It's one of the most. Are you looking at the last passage? Ah, the fifth one. Huh, the fifth one? Fifth one. It says passage five. There's one more. Turn the page. Hey, government, pass, turn the page, please. You see it? Right, passage 5. All right. P 
<laughs> Passage 5. You see it? That's the most emotional one of them all. And I want you to read that carefully also because that's the most difficult passage in the you know, group there. It comes from a, one of the greatest tragedies of all times, Oedipus the King, written by Sophocles. Yeah. You familiar with that, the story? Anybody? You heard of Oedipus complex? Yes. How many have heard of it? What does it mean? Mother fixation, okay. Freud borrowed that expression from this guy, Sophocles. Huh? You heard the story? You know the story? Think so. You think so? Oh, that's fantastic. Tell us. Huh? Tell us. I'm not sure, but okay. I let's see if I'm right. Was he blind from before? No. No, then I haven't. Then something else, which is soon Okay, the story is most beautiful, and it's as I say, one of the most known tragedies written in, the, in world literature by Sophocles. And when the play begins, King Oedipus, you know, who is the king in Greece at that time, there's a plague in his city. So people have come to him and said, We have this plague in the city and do something about it. So in those times, they used to go to the you know, oracle and ask the oracle what is the why this plague. So they go to the oracle and the oracle said that the uh, king before Oedipus was murdered and his uh, killer was never punished. He was never found and punished and therefore the plague. So Oedipus, the king at that time, takes it upon himself to find out who the murderer was of the king, Laos, you know, who is dead. So uh, he said, uh, they call Tiresias, who is a blind philosopher in Greek mythology, who is also a seer or a clairvoyant. And they ask him, who uh, killed King Laos? So he says, I wouldn't tell. So they torture him. So he's very angry. And he tells Oedipus, you killed him. So Oedipus says, what kind of a seer are you? you know, what kind of a clairvoyant are you? And you're blind, you can't see anything. Now you are angry because we tortured you, you say, I killed him. So Tiresias says, I'm blind, but I see. With both of your eyes, you still cannot see the truth. He's set free, and Oedipus continues his search 